right now. A big drop in temperatures had some folks in San Antonio walking outside in sweatshirts, others bundled up with a blanket. And for some, the colder temperatures only meant more dancing to try to stay warm. And as it so often goes with the first big temperature plunge in South Texas, some people we talked to feeling colder than they expected. I wasn't really expecting it. My hands are like freezing. I'm so cold. Definitely some gloves. Yeah. It's, it's colder than you think. Yeah. <laughs> Once the, the breeze, breeze hits yeah. you. <laughs> How cold is it supposed to be? <laughs> That's a good question. A lot of people are wondering tonight. How cold and for how long? I just love seeing everybody's reactions to how cold it is the first time uh, this season. And it is very, very cold out there. Taking a look outside, you can see that camera shaking. And the reason for that is the winds from the north. I want to show you just how drastic of a change this was earlier today. So this is earlier. This is right at about noon. Kerrville was cold. But here in San Antonio, we were in the 80s. Then that front moved through right at about 2, uh, 30 to 3, and temperatures took a big tumble. We went from 84 degrees to where we are right now, 47 degrees in just a few matter of hours. So it was very, very uh, dr drastic change, and we're looking at cloudy skies right now, and this is a look at current temperatures. It's already 39 degrees in Kerrville, 43 in Tarpley, 44 in Bolverde, 47 at GBSA Randolph, 49 in Port say 47 in Stinson and it is very windy. We were just talking about this in the newsroom. We stepped out for our dinner break and it was noticeably chilly outside and it is going to stay that way throughout the honestly throughout the next couple of days through Wednesday morning. It should be very chilly for us. These winds from the north at about 20 miles per hour gusting up to 30 miles per hour actually give us our wind chill. First time I've had to show this graphic in a long time. The wind chill values if it feels like it's almost freezing up at Bernie Stage Airfield. It feels like 31 degrees in Kerrville and it feels like 38 in Bolverde. Now, while we're not seeing any rain here in San Antonio, there still are some light rain showers out to the west near Sabinal and Uvalde. And these light rain showers will be possible uh, through tomorrow as well. It's not going to amount to much, but it is going to keep our temperatures on the cool side. And even though we're in the 40s right now, we've got even more cooling to go. We'll be very chilly tomorrow morning. I'll show you those morning temperatures coming up in just a bit. Now, please do everything you can to make sure you follow the health guidance. It is crucial to put those into place right now. So let me turn it over now. A warning tonight as San Antonio begins to see a rise in COVID-19 cases, hospitalizations and the positivity rate. Health officials expressing concern and reminding you to stay home if you feel sick and limit social gatherings. The local positivity rate rising to 6.9% tonight. It was 5.8% a week ago. Our seven day rolling average also rising tonight to 192 cases per 24 hours and our risk level has gone up from low to moderate level. As you see there, no new deaths were reported today, but there was a jump in hospitalizations. 248 COVID-19 patients are in the hospital tonight. 91 are now in the intensive care unit, while 45 are on ventilators. Bear County Commissioner Justin Rodriguez telling the community to not let their guard down as other parts of Texas are already dealing with a dramatic rise in cases. We're seeing the ramifications of potentially letting off the gas um, in El Paso and other communities. So I think uh, we just got to keep that at the forefront. El Paso's situation has gotten so bad they've had to fly patients to other cities for care, including right here in San Antonio. So far, we have about five patients from there. El Paso also under a curfew to try and prevent cases from spreading as the holiday season nears. According to the Southwest Texas Regional Advisory Council, or STRAC, the plan is to transfer 15 to 20 patients daily to cities like San Antonio, Austin, Houston, and Dallas over the next several days. A family is searching for closure and answers after their loved one was killed in a hit and run. Alex Reyna was killed while on his way to work this weekend. The night team's Tiffany Huertas reports that San Antonio police are still searching for the driver who caused that crash. He gave me a kiss goodbye and a baby and told us I love you. I'll see you later. That's the last time Maria de la Luz Guerrero Reyna saw her husband. And I go, no, y'all are lying to me. Y'all are lying to me. He, he's coming home. He's okay. 
They said, no, there was a really bad car accident and he was in there. 24-year-old Alex Reyna was on his way to work when he was involved in a crash. San Antonio police say around 7.40 a.m. Saturday, Reyna was driving westbound on I-10 East near the I-37 interchange when a woman in a 1997 green Honda SUV switched lanes to pass him. Police say the woman then jerked the SUV, crashing into Reyna. His Tahoe crashed into a large metal sign, killing him on impact. The Honda crashed into a guardrail. Police say the driver walked away from the scene. This person needs to turn herself in. I don't know who this person is, but they need to turn herself in because this person doesn't know what she did. This baby's not going to see her daddy no more. And I'm not going to see my son no more. Reina's mother remembers his smile. He's a happy person. He's an animal lover. She says Reina loved his family to the core. I love you. His six-month-old daughter and his pregnant wife will never get to see him again. I just want the, the peace and justice for my husband. If you saw or know anything about Saturday morning's crash, call police. When the driver is caught, she is expected to be charged with failure to stop and render aid, resulting in death. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. Taking a look at other stories we're following tonight. Right now, police searching for a woman following a robbery on the north side of town. Police are calling 27-year-old Danielle Nicole Castro a fugitive. Uh, investigators say the robbery happened at the corner of 281 and Evans Road back on October 18th. Two people approached the man who was sitting on a curb at the shopping center before shooting at the victim and running off with some of his items. Police say an investigation led to a warrant being issued for Castro. If you know where she is tonight, Crime Stoppers, give them a call, 210-224-STOP. Police need your help looking for this man. Take a good look at your screen. Investigators calling 20-year-old Mark Talamantes a person of interest in a homicide investigation. The body of Sean Gaetan was found near Hildebrandt and Casillas back in June. That's on the city's southeast side. Gaetan's vehicle was reported stolen, and police say they have learned that Talamantes had it. If you know where Talamantes is, call SAPD at 210-207-7635. Turning out of the 2020 election, polling sites closing within just the last few minutes. A reminder, early voting continues through Friday, and those sites will stay open until 10 p.m. each night this week, giving voters more time to get to the polls. We've already beat records here in Bear County for voter turnout. The tally of voters still coming in for today. Yesterday, more than 14,000 people cast a ballot. That brings the total to 435,505, but that number is set to rise after today's ballots are counted. Meanwhile, the Bear County Elections Office says voters who are deaf can get interpreter assistance at two sites. Those locations are the Bear County Elections Department on Frio Street and the San Antonio College voting site. The nonprofit No Barriers Communications wants the county to get iPads to every voting site so it can use video remote interpreters like it does on Frio Street. Elections Administrator Jackie Callanan said she hopes to grow the number of sites with interpreter assistance but said they plan to buy more devices like the nonprofit once, but that won't happen in time for this year's election. And early voting is set to wrap up on Friday. Election Day is then set for November 3rd. More than 7 million voters in Texas have cast a ballot. Today, the Castro brothers were on the west side to vote at the St. Paul Community Center, encouraging others to cast their ballots as well. We're very encouraged to see the record turnout that we're having. I'm especially grateful to see so many young people that are coming out to vote. Texas is a swing state this year. People are coming out to vote uh, like never before. People are coming out in unprecedented numbers, so much so that Texas actually leads the nation right now in the number of voted, voters. With two my grave. Before his death, she says she tried to get him involved with different organizations and counseling services. In March, that changed where the resources she turned to shut their doors due to COVID-19 restrictions. I kind of saw him go down where he didn't have a job and he would get, you know, kind of nervous, you know, anxious. 
Julie Strench with Roy Moss Youth Alternatives says she's familiar with situations like Falcones. She says teens lacking positive resources tend to turn to bad behaviors. Like getting into gangs or other dynamics that aren't healthy. Unlike other organizations, Roy Moss has stayed open 24-7 since the pandemic, helping neglected, abused, and troubled teens. In fact, Strength says she's seen an uptick in families using their services, including their drop-in center and the emergency shelter, which allows children to stay overnight in certain cases. Anxiety and depression, the numbers are astronomical through the roof since pandemic. Strength says their biggest goal is encouraging families to find a positive role model for their children to look up to. Find the future, find the ability to look forward and not feel like they're failing. Strength is encouraging the community to step up during this time of need. If we don't, as community members and stakeholders in the community, help reach out and touch these young men and women, we're going to lose them to the counterculture. Jaffney Gray, KSAT 12 News. To contact Roy Moss Youth Alternatives for services or a connection to other resources, just look for the story on our website at KSAT.com. Still ahead on the night beat, the coronavirus crisis leading to a rise in deaths in dozens of states. The latest from the White House Coronavirus Task Force is coming up. And a new sculpture installed in downtown San Antonio. The message the city hopes it will send as visitors and residents pass by these massive pieces of metal. But first, a new Supreme Court justice confirmed tonight. The new addition just days ahead of the presidential election next on the night. Tonight, a new justice confirmed to the U.S. Supreme Court. Senate Republicans voting this evening to confirm President Donald Trump's nominee, Amy Coney Barrett. She will fill the seat vacated by the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. ABC's Faith Abube is on Capitol Hill with details of this historic vote. The nomination of Amy Coney Barrett of Indiana to be an associate justice of the Supreme Court of the United States is confirmed. And with that, Senate Republicans cemented a 6-3 conservative majority on the U.S. Supreme Court, a vote that makes Amy Coney Barrett only the fifth woman to serve on the nation's highest court. This is one of the most brilliant, admired, and well-qualified qualified nominees in our lifetime. Democrats fighting the process all the way till the very end, arguing it's too close to the election and threatens the future of the Affordable Care Act, civil and abortion rights. The American people will suffer the consequences of Judge Barrett's far right out of the mainstream views for generations. Soon after the confirmation vote, newly minted Justice Barrett and several prominent Republicans headed to the White House for an outdoor swearing-in ceremony. Justice Barrett made clear she will issue rulings based solely upon a faithful reading of the law and the Constitution as written, not legislate from the bench. Justice Clarence Thomas on hand to administer one of two oaths of office Barrett needs to take before beginning her duties on the high court. I, Amy Coney Barrett, do solemnly swear. One of her first cases, a provision of the Affordable Care Act before the court just a week after the election. The oath that I have solemnly taken tonight means at its core that I will do my job without any fear or favor and that I will do so independently of both the political branches and of my own preferences. And soon after the vote, a few progressive Democrats took to Twitter with three words, expand the court. Joe Biden has said if he wins in November, he plans to appoint a commission to study any changes to the U.S. Supreme Court. Faith Abube, ABC News, Capitol Hill. Here at home, a new piece of public art in San Antonio. The 33-foot sculpture is called the Door of Equality and is standing at the San Pedro Roundabout, just north of the San Antonio Central Library. The two twisted steel columns are a gift from Fundacion Sebastián and Siempre México. The city said it represents the work done by human rights champions in San Antonio. District 1 City Councilman Roberto Trevino said the sculpture serves as a visual reminder to continue the fight behind what's right and just. 
KSAT Explains recently took a look at the issue of racism as a public health crisis. We peered into the past and what communities in San Antonio faced then and what's changed now. And we asked city leaders, what does the city council's resolution declaring racism as a public health crisis actually do? The full episode is ready to stream right now on the KSAT TV app. Take a live look outside with a city cam. Looks a little, I don't know, out of focus there. Hard to tell. <laughs> yeah, I think it, I, I think can that definitely is tell you it is cold out there. I was surprised when I ducked out of here between the shows to get dinner. Yeah, it's yeah. nice looking in from the inside. Yes. Right. I think you said, Tim, that we skipped fall and we you know, went right into winter. We went right into winter. We really did. And that's the power of a strong cold front. We definitely saw that front move through in the afternoon. We were already in the 80s this afternoon and now we're in the 40s and tomorrow morning will be even colder. So let's go ahead and take a look outside right now and I'll show you the almanac for the day. The high temperature was 84 degrees, five degrees above average. And we're currently experiencing uh, the low for the day, which is right now about 47. Uh, our record low, 38, back in 1955. Hey, we did see a little bit of rain today, especially in the morning, uh, about five hundredths of an inch of rainfall. But honestly, that's not going to do much to put a a dent in the drought at all and over the next few days we'll continue to see light rain and it won't really amount to too much. It'll just kind of be that nuisancey rain which will keep things cool for us, which for some is a welcome change. Temperatures around the area, it's 38 in Kerrville, 34 in Rock Springs, 45 in Del Rio, 55 in Carrizo Springs and 55 Catula. Uh, you can see where that front is right now. It's still 77 degrees in Corpus Christi. The front has yet to move through Corpus Christi. It will a little bit later on tonight and into the early morning hours. Tomorrow Tomorrow, but that's a 30 degree difference from San Antonio to Corpus Christi, an impressive cold front with some gusty winds behind it. We've seen winds gust up to about 30 miles per hour already today. Right now the winds are gusting anywhere from about 20 to 25 miles per hour. It's cold here, but it is just downright cold up in the Panhandle, Texas. It's 18 degrees in Amarillo, well below freezing in Lubbock. Amarillo and Lubbock both had some wintry precipitation today, some snow and some ice up there. We're not going to see anything like that here in San Antonio, uh, we're just going to see some some areas of light rain. And the reason for that is this trough of low pressure uh, right uh, near Baja, California. It's going to kick up the atmosphere and allow us to squeeze out a little bit of moisture that we have left. I mean, look what's happening right next to this upper level low out near El Paso and in parts of New Mexico. Some precipitation there, including some snow near Albuquerque. And so as I take you through the future cast, what you'll see is you'll see that light rain on the future cast tomorrow first in the morning. It'll lighten up a little bit in the afternoon, uh, but then again, uh, Tuesday night into Wednesday, we'll have another chance for some scattered light rain. And the areas that get light rain may get up to about a tenth to a quarter of an inch of rainfall, but those are going to be the lucky areas. The rest of us probably only amounting to a few hundredths of an inch of rain. And then by Wednesday afternoon, that trough of low pressure is going to push all the rain off to the east. We're going to have a ton of sunshine here in San Antonio as early as Wednesday afternoon. Meanwhile, the coast of Louisiana is going to have to deal with a hurricane. This has been a very active hurricane season. We're already into the Greek letters. That's Hurricane Zeta, which again is expected to make landfall Wednesday evening near Louisiana coast. Here back at home uh, in San Antonio tomorrow morning will be in the low 40s. It's going to be very chilly. You're going to want to wear a jacket and a scarf uh, because temperatures in the 30s in Kerrville will actually feel a lot colder than that because we'll still have a wind from the north at 10 to 20. And so we'll have a wind chill. It'll feel like it's in the 30s, potentially even in the 20s in some places. It's going to be a cold start to the day. And then on top of that, because it's going to be cloudy with areas of light rain, it's going to be cold in the afternoon too. We'll be lucky if we can get up to 52 degrees tomorrow uh, for the afternoon afternoon high temperature. What a different forecast 24 hours makes. Wind chills in the 30s tomorrow morning, scattered light rain. We'll still be in the 40s at noon, 52 for that high north winds at 10 to 20. They'll lighten up a little bit by the evening hours tomorrow, but it's still going to be a breezy day. And then just to take you through the next few days, a cold start to Wednesday with some more light rain. And then by the time of the afternoon, we'll see sun 64, so still pretty cool to close out the week. Ample sunshine, chilly mornings, though we're not really going to warm up all that much. 40s for the morning lows, afternoon highs in the 70s. Halloween looks 
awesome for some socially distanced trick-or-treating. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Big fight night this weekend in the Alamo City. Yeah, I'm actually calling it fight night on fright night because it takes place <laughs> on Halloween in the Alamo Dome. It's a chance for San Antonio's own Mario Barrios to defend his world championship belt. When we come back, we'll get you ready for the big fight. And also, we're calling it the COVID comeback for San Antonio school districts, schools, and teams. They're ready to play football this week. We've got a preview of a big game coming up. Uh, obviously, the frustration for him as well is just, you know, look, when he misses them, nobody, whoops, excuse me, I got something in my eye. Um, just had some Tabasco on my finger and it went in my eye. That wasn't good. The Cowboys are so snake bit that defensive coordinator Mike Nola had to call up a press conference today after he accidentally got hot sauce in his eye in big board sports. But first, fighters are already starting to arrive in San Antonio for Saturday night's World Championship boxing card at the Alamo Dome, the first boxing event to allow fans since the COVID-19 outbreak. Our own Mario Barrios will be the co-main event in the Showtime pay-per-view showcase. He'll be defending his WBA World Super Lightweight Championship belt since winning it last year, and it's his first fight this year. So he's worried about being rusty after having a year off. You know, the, the layoff, you know, it's not something, you know, that's, that's getting to me. Um, you know, there's no nerves, no no anxiety. Um, you know, it's like clocking into work, you know, um, when, the, when it comes to fights. Uh, and you know, I'm just anxious, you know, to just to be back home uh, pretty much, you know. Uh, it's been a long camp. All right, you can buy tickets through Ticketmaster, the Alamo Dome box office. The price for the pay-per-view event is $74.99. You can read more about the upcoming fights on Instant Replay page of KSAT.com. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. The Dallas Cowboys head coach Mike McCarthy is calling out his team for not having their quarterbacks back. That's after Andy Dalton made his second start in the place of the injured Dak Prescott. Cowboys are playing from behind all day long in Washington with a patchwork of an offensive line due to injuries. Now the third quarter, Dalton tried to make something happen down 22-3, but as he went down on the slide, Washington's John Bostic delivered this vicious and dangerous helmet-to-helmet -helmet hit on Dalton, actually knocking the helmet off of Dalton and leaving him on the field. Somehow Andy managed to get to his feet, walked to the locker room with assistance, and you could tell by the look on his face he has no idea where he is. What upset McCarthy is that not one single player on the Cowboys confronted Bostic about the hit. There's definitely, a, you know, I mean, a hit that uh, caused a disqualification. But, yeah, well, I mean, we, 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 we speak all the time about playing for one another, you know, protecting one another. Uh, so yeah, definitely it was, it was probably not the response that you would expect. Dalton is officially listed as questionable right now, going through the concussion protocol. If he can't go, the Cowboys will go with the rookie Ben DiNucci with Garrett Gilbert as his backup against the Eagles in Philadelphia. The big game and our big game coverage has the San Antonio School District making a COVID comeback. Next. The UTSA Roadrunners ended their three-game losing streak by getting an important Conference USA victory at home Saturday night against Louisiana Tech. The victory improves UTSA to 4-3 and three on the season, more importantly 2-1 and one in conference play. But the Roadrunners had to come from behind in order to secure the 27-26 victory. In doing so, former Judson running back Sincere McCormick registered his fourth 100-yard game of the season with 165 yards on the day and three touchdowns as he continues to be the leading rusher in college football. And now the Conference USA Offensive Player of the Week. But even more impressive is the fact he carried the boys school record 37 times so considering his workload on saturday how was he on sunday he's awesome he was in my office the very next morning just laughing and then just he's in great spirits and bouncing around here you it's unbelievable the kid is mentally tough physically tough he loves san antonio he loves his university he loves his teammates and that's just who Sincere McCormick is. Next up, the Roadrunners hit the road to take on Florida Atlantic Saturday at 11 a.m. The big game and our big game coverage this Friday night is between the Sam Houston Hurricanes and the Brackenridge Eagles. It marks a COVID comeback for the San Antonio Independent School District. District officials deciding on the most conservative plan to return to play, targeting the week of October 28th as the first time games can be held due to the coronavirus. In order to accommodate the shortened season, San Antonio schools in District 13 5A Division 1 will play zone play or about half of their schedule before the playoffs kick off. The showdown also marks the start of the last season as head coach for Brack's Willie Hall before he retires after 30 37 years with the Eagles. This being his last season, we're part of a legacy right now. And, you know, 
we got to capitalize off. We got to, you know, do our thing. We got to make big plays. We're just really grateful and thankful to have a season. Well, we're not worried about anything else. We just want to go out there and win as much games as possible. It feels great. Uh, we've been waiting a while for this. I feel like we're well prepared. I know they are too. And uh, we're going to put on a great game. It's going to be tough, but we got to get mentally prepared, which we are. And we're going to be physically. So we're just ready to get out there and play a good matchup. They beat us last year. We're going to we ain't worried. We worried about that. We worried about this year. So we got we got something coming for them. There you go. It all happens in Alamo Stadium Friday night at 7:30. And the actual first game to be played in Alamo Stadium this year will be Lanier and Jefferson on Thursday night. Great to see those kids finally getting there. And they love it. Yes. Absolutely. Thanks, Greg. We'll be right back. We are just days away from Election Day, setting record number of voters here in Bear County and across the U.S. And so we're, of course, wanting to get some insight on what we should be looking for and what we may be able to expect over the coming days. So tonight's KSAT Q&A, let's bring in Dr. Henry Flores, a Professor Emeritus of Political Science at St. Mary's University. Good to see you again tonight. Thanks so much for being with us. Uh, let's first start with those record number of voters for the early vote in Bear County. Since we talked earlier tonight at 6 o'clock, I've seen some other Texas counties that have been setting records when it comes to early voting. More totals so far than all of 2016 for the early vote count. What does that say to you? Well, it just says that there's a great amount of interest and excitement in this particular election and um, the political parties are are energized and on the on their, their street operations are are really uh, fantastic because they're they're the ones that get the vote out. The, the parties are the ones that really get the vote out in the general election. And so I guess they're working very, very aggressively. The one thing that I read today that stood out to me was that uh, Governor Greg Abbott announced today that he was going to be sending a thousand Texas Guard, National Guard members throughout the, the state of Texas to major cities uh, to defend against possible post-election violence or disturbances. What do you think about that? And is there anything that we've seen in history like that recently where we would require uh, National Guard to be in place in case there's post-election violence? No, I've never seen anything like that. I've, I've, I've seen cases where the United States Marshal Service has been sent to various states to oversee elections, given their 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 the history of, of uh, the way they've conducted some of their elections. That's always been the guard against voter fraud, not violence. Um, I don't I, you know, I don't know if the governor received any credible reports of, of, of potential violence out there. So I really can't speak to his his. That particular motive, um, it could be uh, perceived in some communities as intimidation. Uh, so that might make some voters, particularly minority voters, uh, hesitant to go to the polls. So I mean, there's could there, there's a lot of implications with that, I, and I've never really I've never seen it, except in the Reconstruction South after the Civil War, where federal troops were sent in to to uh, protect uh, some of the election processes. We talk about the the high number of early voter turnout. So I'm curious if you think that, you know, once the early vote totals come in, once the polls close on Election Day, we all start looking at those numbers with the caveat that a lot more precincts are going to be coming in uh, with reporting their numbers. But with such a high early vote turnout, do you think there's any more emphasis going to be placed on where candidates stand based on the numbers right when the polls close? in this election compared to pre previous ones? Actually, yes, because um, I think, as I mentioned in the early, earlier uh, segment, um, we've been watching early voting totals over the last few years, and they've been increasingly, they've been getting larger. Every election, more and more people are choosing the early voting option. Uh, I saw one estimate where they expect that 80% of all the voters are going to cast a vote will have casted in early votes in this general election. So by election night, we may have a really good feel for, uh, before before the, even the election day votes are cast, how the election is going to go. Um, I have looked at uh, some data uh, concerning um, the turnout in those states where people register by party. That's not all the states. Texas is not one of those. You don't register by political party in Texas. Um, but it seems like Democratic turnout is much higher across the nation 
in those particular states. And um, also um, in mail-in voting, they're ahead. Uh, they're also ahead in an interesting category in mail-in ballots that have not been returned yet. Actually, more people that are registered as Democrats have requested ballots than, than, in, than any other category. Uh, an interesting category that's out there that we're not talking about in those particular states are unaffiliated voters. And a large percentage, there's been a large percentage of individuals that have been identified as unaffiliated in those particular states where you register for a party uh, who are participating and their numbers are extremely high. So, and I'm not sure who they are, they're first time voters or maybe they're independents who had never decided to cast a vote before. But we have to keep an eye on them, I would think. Uh, so those are some interesting trends that I see going out there um, uh, so far. The African-American vote is very high. The Latino vote's very high. Uh, it's just an extraordinary, unique election year. And, and uh, uh, there's a lot of excitement and interest, and, and people are casting their votes just across the board. I think that's a good segue into my question. We often hear every four years about the effort to get the youth vote out, and we hear mm -hmm. that you know there, there's so many different things rock the vote, and they try to get people registered to vote, and it's going to be a huge impact. But we've never really seen that young vote show up to the polls yet. Is this possibly the the election where where the youth vote has an impact? Absolutely, we're seeing their numbers uh, uh, increased as well. Uh, yeah, this is. Uh, one of the things that, that, that a lot of folks don't don't think about uh, is that you know on any given day there's a whole new cohort of 18 year olds, uh, as many as 100,000 to 200,000 across the country every day turning 18, and, and every four years that means the electorate's going to electorate's going to change dramatically. You're going to have the older cohort either pass away or they're going to stop voting, and the younger cohort coming in. And as the years go by, and and as our demographics change, our population is going to get a little bit younger and um, their votes are going to start making a lot more difference than, than, than a lot of the other age cohorts. Dr. Henry Flores, Professor Emeritus of Political Science at St. Mary's University. Thanks as always for being with us. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll be right back. Turning out to COVID across the country, more than 8.6 million Americans have now been infected with COVID-19 as the number of hospitalizations rise in at least 37 states. ABC's Marcy Gonzalez tracking the numbers for us tonight. Urgent pleas as the number of coronavirus cases rises in 27 states. The U.S. seeing the highest number of new cases in a 48-hour period since the pandemic began. We've never been as vulnerable as we are right now, and we've got to start acting differently. In Utah, hospitals warning they could soon be forced to ration ICU beds. I did not think we were ever going to get to a point where we were going to deny people care in the ICU based on age or how sick they are. If that starts starting to happen already, and we have many, many weeks uh, of this surge to go, I am starting to get concerned that we may get into trouble. And in El Paso, Texas, hospitals are at capacity. Surge tents now up as they prepare for even more COVID-19 patients. By next Wednesday, we're going to need another 200 plus hospital rooms. Health officials continue urging Americans who've been in contact with anyone who's infected to quarantine. But Vice President Mike Pence, the head of the White House Coronavirus Task Force, is on the campaign trail, despite five members of his team testing positive for the virus, including his personal assistant and chief of staff. President Trump, also on the campaign trail, still downplaying the ongoing threat from the virus. And we're rounding the turn. You know, all they want to talk about is COVID. By the way, on November 4th, you won't be hearing so much about it. COVID, COVID, COVID. At least 23 coronavirus cases have now been linked to three Trump campaign events in Minnesota last month, according to the state's health department. Many at the president's rallies not wearing masks. A study from the University of Washington estimating if 95 percent of Americans wear a mask, it could save nearly 130,000 lives before February. If people are not wearing masks, then maybe we should be mandating it. Marcy Gonzalez, ABC News, Los Angeles.
Back here at home, city health officials reminding all of us to stay safe as we near the Day of the Dead holiday. It's a tradition used to honor those who have passed. The city saying we honor those we've lost to keep those we have safe. It's a reminder about the importance of mask wearing, hand washing and social distancing. And coming up in just a few days, the Day of the Dead River Parade goes virtual. It's happening this Friday, October 30th. Both ECs and Steve will be out hosting the celebration from 8 until 10. From the sweet to the sour to the spicy, the flavors of Mexican candy familiar to a lot of people here in San Antonio. And those flavors only seem to be getting more popular. The Mexican candy craze is the topic of this week's episode of KSAT Explains. This week we take a look at the history of Mexican candy and we learned it dates back thousands of years. Some treats can be traced back to before the Spanish conquest of the Aztec Empire in the 1500s. One example, candies made with seeds from amaranth plants, honey and fruit. You can still find them in stores that sell Mexican candy today. To me, it's amazing that the candy or the sweet stuff from prehistoric times comes all the way down to 2020. We learned a lot in this episode. I bet you will too. <laughs> Case that explains Mexican candy, the, the craze behind it, what well, that will be available to stream on Thursday on the KSAT TV app as well as KSAT.com. You can find that app on Roku, Fire Stick, and most other streaming devices. My daughter is a true San Antonian. She loves Mexican. Ooh, oh I love God. those watermelons yeah. that are Ooh. covered in the yes. chili, the lupin. Yes, mm -hmm. she loves those. A little oh, lollipops. Meanwhile, taking out the look outside, this was a real deal cold front. The other oh ones were kind of teasers. This one smacks you right in the face you walk outside. It's um, cold. Yeah, quite literally. The wind will smack <laughs> you right in the face. Those winds are gusting up to 30 miles per hour, bringing in some very cold Arctic air. I want to show you the time lapse from today. It was sunny for part of the day. It was warm, too. We got up to 84 degrees, but then that cold front moved in. Skies got cloudy, and we've even seen a few light rain showers out there. You can see them on some on the time lapse there uh, on the screen. It's now 47 degrees outside, so we dropped from 84 to 47. Winds are from the north, gusting up to 22 right now. Uh, and that uh, cold front is also ushering out some humidity, so we won't have to deal with humidity. It's going to be chapstick weather. It'll be dry, uh, so just keep that in mind. But we are still seeing some very light rain showers, not around San Antonio at the moment, but west of San Antonio near Yvette. Valley, Sabinal, right along Highway 83. They're pushing up to Lakey. Uh, these are very light, quick streamer showers, and this is the kind of rain that we'll be able to see over the next two days or so. Uh, again, no rain around San Antonio at the moment, but you may run into some sprinkles. Temperatures, on the other hand, falling as we speak even more. It's 41 at Bernie Stage Airfield, 46 in Holotus, 38 degrees in Kerrville, Lost Maples. 37 degrees this uh, evening, 47 at JBSA Randolph and 48 in New Braunfels. A wider view here, Rock Springs just two degrees above freezing. Now I don't think we're gonna have a freeze in the hill country uh, tonight uh, for our KSAT 12 viewing areas. Even if Rock Springs dips just to 32 degrees, it won't be there for long. Uh, in Kerrville, temperatures are in the 30s, still above freezing. 48 in Hondo, 49 in Valley, 45 in Del Rio. And again, it's breezy right now, those winds, not not quite as strong as they were just an hour or so ago, but they're strong enough to give us a wind chill. It feels like it's 31 in Kerrville and it feels about five degrees cooler in San Antonio. What's really impressive is how cold it feels in Amarillo. One lonely degree in Amarillo, Texas. That's what it feels like. And those areas, Amarillo and Lubbock and the Panhandle have actually had to deal with snow and ice. Now, a wider view here, we've got this upper level low that's going to be allowing for us to see another chance at some some scattered light rain pretty much throughout the day tomorrow, but especially in the morning. And then again, by Wednesday morning, we'll see some scattered light rain. Not going to be a drought denter. We're not going to see much rain from this, maybe only a few hundredths of an inch to a tenth of an inch of rain. And then it'll be sunny as early as Wednesday afternoon. So waking up tomorrow, 42 in San Antonio, 37 in Kerrville, 35 in Rock Springs, 46 in the Valley and 41 in Del Rio. A neighborhood view here, 44 for the wake up temperature in New Braunfels, 45 in C 
Seguin, 41 in Bernie, and 44 in Castroville. It's not going to warm up too much tomorrow at all. High temperature probably in the low 50s for all of us. And again, uh, that rain chance is best in the morning. Uh, in the afternoon, it'll just pretty much be cloudy. North winds at 10 to 20 miles per hour. Skies will be clearing on Wednesday. We'll still be only be in the 60s, so it's going to stay cool over the next two days. And even into the end of the week, We'll still be sunny and near 70 degrees, but with low humidity, it'll feel great outside, great for Halloween. Just a friendly reminder, fall back Sunday morning. Got to turn those clocks back uh, as daylight saving time comes to an end. Yeah, that's exactly what we need, an extra hour of 2020. <laughs> <I'm>... <laughs> but we'll do it. Thanks, Sarah. Still ahead on the night beat, as the race for a vaccine continues, some have wondered about accessibility. Coming up, the idea that would have put Santa Claus towards the front of the line. Hmm. And can air purifiers help if someone in your home comes down with COVID-19? 12 on your side's Marilyn Moritz takes a look at the issue. Plus, one airline's plan to convince passengers a plane that's been grounded worldwide should be considered safe. Next on the night. American Airlines has plans to use the Boeing 737 MAX aircrafts if they're approved. The aircraft's grounded around the globe after two deadly crashes overseas. America now looking for ways to convince passengers they are safe to fly. The airline's plans may include question and answer sessions with pilots and mechanics as well as tours of the plane. Airlines believe the aircraft could be cleared to fly again next month. Air Canada is the only other airline that intends to have the 737 MAX on their future schedules as well. Both airlines are still waiting for the Federal Aviation Administration to give the approval. Trump administration official wanted to give Santa performers a COVID-19 vaccine ahead of the general public. That's according to the Wall Street Journal. Elves and Mrs. Claus would have also been included. Michael Caputo, an HHS assistant secretary, wanted the Santas to drum up awareness for vaccination events around the country. But the Department of Health and Human Services said the plan is now off the table. Mr. Caputo took a 60-day medical leave last month. Can an air purifier protect you from the coronavirus? We're talking about the kind of machine you buy for a room in your house. 12 on your side's Marilyn Moritz takes a look at what they can and can't do. Air purifiers. They can keep dust and smoke and other allergens at bay. But what if someone in your home is sick? Can an air purifier help? Consumer Reports Chief Science Officer says the answer isn't a simple yes or no. For an air purifier to be effective, it must be able to consistently draw enough air to reduce the amount of particles which contain the virus that persist in the air. The HEPA filters in most residential air purifiers are certified to capture 99.97% of particles that are 0.3 micron in diameter. But the filters also capture both smaller and larger particles even more efficiently, including the coronavirus. But if someone in your home is sick, the air purifier should be near them, isolated in a separate room. Even then, it's not a cure-all. The faster an air purifier can exchange air in a room, successfully passing the air through its filter, the better its chances are of capturing those virus-laden particles. Even then, it's not going to eliminate all the particles in the room, nor will the filter capture viruses that have landed on surfaces. In, the room. in Consumer Reports test, this $830 Blue Air was the best and fastest, but it's pricey. For less money, they recommend this Honeywell model. It got excellent ratings at high speed, very good at lower speed. An air purifier is not a replacement for wearing a mask, distancing, or washing your hands. And remember, just opening up a window and letting the fresh air in can help clear the air. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. It's not traditionally known as the season of giving, but one girl is using Halloween to help others. The gathering of goodies, up next on the Night Beat. Here's something good to wrap up this newscast. Check this out. A nine-year-old girl in Central California didn't want kids who lost their homes in this year's Creek Fire to lose out on celebrating Halloween. So Arna Chalasani posted a video on GoFundMe asking for help to create Halloween goodie bags. 
She ended up raising $1,200 to make 130 packs. She's using the rest of the money to buy winter jackets for those kids in need. That is awesome. Good job. And tomorrow morning, we'll start off at 42 degrees with a wind chill in the 30s in some places. We will have scattered light rain. As a result of the cloud cover and the chance for rain, we'll really only get up to about 52 degrees, and it'll be breezy throughout the day. We'll see skies clear in the afternoon on Wednesday, still only in the 60s, ending the week with tons of sunshine, chilly mornings, comfortable afternoons. I think it's safe to say that fall has finally arrived to San Antonio. <laughs> Looks good for Halloween, too. Let's hope it sticks this time. Yeah. That does it for the night. Don't forget, good morning. San Antonio starts at 4.30. Have a good night.